Welcome to the Sunrise Podcast, powered by Sunrise Labs. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Making Bright Ideas Work, a podcast by Sunrise Labs. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and I'm really looking forward to today's breakdown on the podcast. Thanks again for tuning in, and make sure you're subscribing wherever you're listening to your podcasts to follow up for more content from Sunrise Labs. So on today's episode, we are analyzing the best way to approach relationships with both contract manufacturers and contract design firms when you're launching a new medical device. So here to give his insights on the topic is Eric Soderberg, CEO of Sunrise Labs. Eric, pleasure getting to chat today. How are you doing? Oh, great, Daniel. It's great to be here with you today. Some of my favorite conversations are definitely the ones that look at the intra-industry relationships. Could you give us some context on that industry trend of contract manufacturers, or CMs for short, um, gobbling up design firms? You know, When did this start to be a trend at scale, and how have you seen it impact those intra-industry relationships uh, between CMs and design firms and between those two and the clients they work with? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think this is something that started maybe five years ago that we really started to notice. And and, and, and the way, you know, we notice here at Sunrise is that, you know, we start seeing a lot of interest in, in, in companies. Sometimes they're strategic companies or a manufacturer look, looking to add to their design capabilities. And sometimes they're investors looking to combine firms. When you combine smaller firms to make a bigger firm, the multiplier you get when you flip it, when you when you sell the bigger firm, uh, it's a higher multiplier for a firm that has a, has, has a bigger revenue. So how are you seeing that um, impact the way that CMs and design firms are interacting and interfacing now? Uh, you know, the ones that haven't yet been merged and consolidated. Um, you know, what, what are those conversations like? Has the dynamic changed? We have a potential client here and there that really wants to see the contract manufacturer that's going to make their thing be the same entity that's doing the development of their device. They see it as um, sort of having one throat to choke if, if there's a problem. Uh, and they may feel that, you know, that, that sort of there's down the road revenue for, for this company. So they're going to have to do a really good job for me. And, uh, but, but there's downsides to, uh, to, to that. Well, you know, first and foremost, if you need a, a product design, you, you want to go get a firm that's got experience doing similar things uh, to, to what your product needs to do um, and, and you, you know, sort of leverage their experience doing similar things. And, and uh, you know, you certainly want a reputable firm, um, one that's uh, certified to do medical work. Uh, it, it's... The design firms uh, that that design things day in and day out, so you know, are uh, tend to be, um, you know, up to speed on the latest technologies. And but, but importantly, in this in this context, is they're 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 agnostic as to which technologies to use. So, if if, if I have a um, you know manufacturing plant that has certain processes in it, well, I'm going to design the product to be built in my manufacturing plant. But that's not the way you want to start a new product development effort. Uh, in some cases, it might be your best choice, but it, the, the, what you're losing is that ability to take a fresh look at your your design and match it to the end user's needs and the uh, business needs uh, of, of that device. Um, so, so that can be um, to your detriment. I, example, um, let's, I'll use something from a commercial example. You know, Ford decides they want to uh, develop an electric vehicle. Uh, they may say, oh, you know what we'll do? We'll, we'll, we'll put the batteries where the engine used to go, right? Because that makes sense. And then, and you know what? We have a, because we, we have a manufacturing facility. Ford is obviously a, both a design firm and a manufacturer, right? Uh, so we'll um, use the same crane we used to install the engine and install the battery. And, 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 and that, that, that's, a, that, that's a brilliant idea. Um, Tesla, though, you know, didn't start with a manufacturing capability. They started from scratch, you know, a, a clean sheet design of, of, you know, what could an electric vehicle look like? And they said, well, you know, from a performance standpoint, these batteries are pretty heavy. You know, we better keep them low. And, and, and then the car is going to corner better and, and, and perform better and, and more space for the batteries. Uh, so we're going to design a new platform where these batteries are, are, you know, low. And there's a thing called design for manufacturability, where that's the counter argument here is you want to be, uh, make sure you're designing something that can be built. 
uh, and, you know, you know, I've done a thesis on this in, in, in graduate school, and, and I can tell you what design for manufacturability is all about is matching your design to a manufacturing process. So if you choose that manufacturing process up front by uh, choosing a design firm with a certain manufacturing capability, you've constrained your product to be designed to meet those processes. There's trade-offs there. You, you may not get the best product you could. We're going to dig in a little deeper into all those things that you just mentioned there. Um, I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself because there, there's so much to break down here. You, you mentioned you know, what is motivating these CMs to uh, want to bring design firms under their roof. Break down what the full business cases are for combining those two key processes. And uh, you know, does that vision for contract manufacturers having design in-house and working with one partner, does that always work in their favor? What's your holistic perspective on that? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, one example is your design might be tailored to a, a process that it doesn't necessarily have to be tailored to is one issue. You've got the designer now is, is less free to go off and find the best matches for the manufacturing. So very, very often, one, one of the trends also, you know, sort of big sort of industry trends is every device is a system now, could be an inhaler or something, uh, or, um, you know, it has to be connected so that the user can control it and connected to a smartphone. And inevitably, there's data taken there that needs to be stored in a web and accessed by different stakeholders, whether they be doctors or end users or caregivers. Everything's really a system now. So um, the under one roof, I think, is less, uh, you know, as, as time goes on here and, and things become more integrated, is, is, is sort of um, less possible, really, because when you get into all these different pieces of your system, you're negotiating with different partners. Um, you know, example would be, let's say you have a device, you know, that, that has a catheter, a disposable catheter, that's a piece of it. And this is a balloon catheter that say it has to expand to do something. Certainly you'd be crazy not to find a contract manufacturer that designs catheters. Uh, and, and so you, you, that thing has to be, you know, that they know how to use what kind of silicon and, and, and what kind of other materials to make this thing robust and sterilizable and all those things you have to consider. Um, but do you want the catheter expert writing the code for an iPhone, um, and the cloud backend and things that you're, you're, you're not going to find everything you need under one roof. It's pretty unlikely you'll, you'll, you'll find that if, if it is under one roof, it's a gathering of different companies that were acquired and it, and it, and it's, uh, sort of virtually under one roof. And so it's possible to find that, but to find the right mixture for your device is, is, is not going to uh, be easy. What it looks like from a contract manufacturer standpoint, you know, yeah, they want the design capability. They want to capture more of that value flow. It's hard to find new clients, right? And uh, when you have a client, you want to get all the value you can out of that client. All right, let's change the focus now to um, the actual process for the clients that you're working with and some of the considerations that they are having to take uh, as they're producing a new device. So what are the key steps that your clients take typically to get an effective quality medical device off the ground? Um, and what are the main considerations that you see them take when they're deciding on a design partner? That's a great question. And so usually when our clients come to us, they've already, uh, they, they certainly have a concept and they have a business model uh, that they've worked out and uh, have some funding typically, not always. Um, and, and that's where, um, they've already figured out sort of here's here's the play for the uh, end user. Um, here's where the value add is for this device, uh, why people would be interested in buying it. The first step has been taken. So, you know, they, they've, they've established a company and, and, and they see a need here. Sometimes it's a doctor who sees a hole in, in uh, what's available to him to do his, you know, practice his practice. And he sees this would be awesome if I had this, this device that could do this thing. What we offer to our clients is, as a first step, is to do the uh, the user experience work, which is to go out and talk to real potential end users, show them uh, mock-ups, prototypes, get them playing with it, saying, if you had this, you know, what would be the most important thing to you? What price point 
would be okay for this. We go through the user experience. What what would the um, different stakeholders need in this, including sort of the hospital? What would the hospital need to see if it if it involves a hospital? What would the uh, doctor need to see in in, in the product? Um, you know, what would the patient uh, be most comfortable with and how would it be most effective? So that's the place to start is, is not with the um, sort of what's the most, what's the cheapest way I can build this thing that I've conceived in my head. It's first to go out and say, is this thing I've conceived in my head, uh, do we have this right? And are we considering uh, all the features that are necessary for this? Because to, developing the right product is, is so much more important than anything else. The first, first medical device I ever developed was the iBot um, wheelchair. It stands up, uh, you know, balances, it climbs stairs. It's an amazing machine. It was developed out of this dynamic stability technology and less around, you know, what do the users really need? Uh, so, so we could climb stairs with, 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 if you had some upper arm strength, you could climb stairs with it. But anyone with upper arm strength typically doesn't want a power wheelchair. So it was sort of a, it ends up being a product that that few people are going to use in the end or, or spend you know sp spend all that money on yeah you know i think it's it's critical to you know keep the clients focused on like you said what really matters about the device it's like you know yeah we'll worry about the price we'll worry about the manufacturing process later let's let's put something mm -hmm. together that really solves fundamentally uh, the issue that you're looking to solve and that, um, you know, does it in a way that's um, accessible, easy to use, um, that has interoperability, exactly. right? And, you know, playing on what you just broke down, how do those considerations change for a client when the design firm and the contract manufacturer end up being the same company? Does that change the relationship? Do you see that affecting the product? You know, do you see clients actually almost, you know, materially change how they approach designing the product when they're dealing with a partner that has the full gamut under one roof? Uh, that it shouldn't be any different. The definition of the product and how, how the user uses it or, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a patient. It could be a, a lab instrument. Um, you know, those things are fundamental to, to product design. So they should be done if, if you're with a competent design firm. The, the, difference isn't isn't a huge one to be honest there's we have relationships with multiple contract manufacturers so we bring in contract manufacturers uh, appropriate to the design after the design is, is is defined and that's that's the only difference is is, is that once you've defined the design it, it's much easier to uh, you, you know much better which, which contract manufacturers are better suited for this and you know I'll give you another example I mean we had a client had a client that came to us with a device that that they told us requires hey this is going to need a motor and batteries and electronics to control that motor in a special way to make this device work um, and we prototyped up a design that eliminated the need for a motor or any electronics and long and behold it worked and and so now you know if the contract manufacturer, you know, doesn't need any experience integrating electronics into a, you know, durable and, and sterilizable um, device because, you know, that's just not not needed. Um, and so th that's an example of starting, you know, with, with, with the device design and, and then, okay, now I can choose the contract manufacturer. I have a lot more to choose from. And, and, and not only that, but I can go price different, you know, I can do some, some comparative shopping among contract manufacturers. So, so it, it's always, there, there's always a mix of, you know, which contract manufacturers, you know, what, what's the volume, what's the uh, complexity of the device. Um, different contract manufacturers are, are built around different uh, models there. And, and, and so the design drives a lot of it. And just to wrap up here uh, with, you know, some of the backend processes, uh, you know, I know that digitizing a lot of the design and manufacturing workflow to a degree is actually a case for uh, the two entities still being split because the collaborative aspect of it is easier to achieve uh, to some degree. So what are some of the specific tools that you're seeing helping make that 
uh, split workflow, an independent design firm and then an independent CM. Uh, how are you seeing tools make that workflow more efficient and more capable of handling some of these complex designs? Mm, sure, I'm glad you asked. There's um, a set of CAD tools that we use um, that where we're able to share um, files with uh, the contract manufacturers and, and they can annotate uh, designs you know, directly. They can uh, make changes. We actually uh, will send a bill of material um, to a contract manufacturer and they'll uh, cost the bill of material and, and that, will, that data will come right back to us all electronically. Um, so <clears throat> it is easier, uh, I think, for... Uh, design firms now the days to work with uh, contract manufacturers is there, there there are fewer sort of very specific interfaces that need to be met that are different among all of them there's a lot of sort of more common interfaces now uh, so that we can communicate back and forth with with um, contract manufacturers and really efficiently and effectively whether they're next door or they're in china and, and we've dealt with all those places <laughs> you know uh, across the country as as well uh, you know the so California tends to have the best silicon manufacturing people. And if you have something in high volume, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to probably end up in Asia. Uh, and th that's typically with a disposable of some sort. So, uh, and, and then if it's a high complexity device, there's several contract manufacturers in the New England area that, that we're very familiar with. Um, and, and, and that whole uh, spectrum, we're able to communicate, um, you know, with using these tools in, in a virtual manner and it, and it just... Uh, you know, it, it's not under one roof, uh, but it's, it, 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 it's sort of, you know, at an engineering level, uh, it's well integrated. All right. Eric Soderberg, CEO of Sunrise Labs, thank you so much for a deep dive on this topic. Uh, any final words on, uh, you know, why you recommend avoiding the one throat to choke scenario and going for an independent design team and an independent CM? Well, just keep an open mind. I, I think, uh, the one throat to choke sounds attractive. Uh, in the end, you're going to have a lot of throats, and uh, you know because because <laughs> yeah. it's it's just just the nature of, of systems these days. Uh, but it is it, it is an advantage to 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 the all under one roof. But just keep in mind what you might be losing. That's all. All right, Eric Soderberg, CEO of Sunrise Labs. Thank you for your time on the podcast. Always great again to chat. A pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Making Bright Ideas Work, a Sunrise Labs podcast. If you like what you heard and want to listen to previous episodes, you can head to sunriselabs.com. Click on the News and Events tab on the masthead and you'll see a drop down there for the rest of our podcasts as well as blog posts, events, and news articles. You can also find this podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Make sure you're subscribing there. And make sure you leave a rating and a comment wherever you're listening to your podcast content. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. Till next time.